one of the uh, real challenges of living a life based in spiritual principles is to, uh, you know, accept our humanity mm -hmm. and, and then to live as if we're, we're worthy of being alive and to treat each other as if others are worthy of being alive as well, even if they're uh, behaving like idiots, even if they're, they have perspectives and opinions other than our own, even if they're behaving badly, you know, to, to recognize that it, 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 the different ways of being a human are not infinite, but they're, they're many numbered. And, uh, uh, and the truth of us is infinity, you know, and oneness, uh, spirit. So to find the way of allowing myself to express fully without me judging it and without me looking at it through your eyes to judge it from there, that's, that's a spiritual practice. That's, you know, and it, all of us, no one gets into acting unless they want attention. And most of the people who want attention from acting can't stand having attention. So, you know, <laughs> you're walking in there with these two things happening. And, you know, if you're, if you're an actor, then you also have something that wants to express through you. Right. And, and so I, I just said all of those things in the impersonal. But when you're starting out, you don't have them in the impersonal. You have them in the personal. I, can't, I don't want you to see me. Please see me. I have something to say. And the fact is, I, I don't have anything to say, but something has something to say through me. You know, so finding the way of allowing ourselves to that. One of my theories of, of, of life and spirituality is that it's, it's my job to, to, to be a channel rather than to think I know what, what any situation needs. To engage deeply within myself and then be willing to let it come out the way it wants to come out, and good acting is the same thing. Mm -hmm. So life acting, there, there's precious little difference other than you know, like uh, acting is just real life, uh, but usually a heightened circumstance. Very few of us have that many heightened circumstances in right, our actual exactly. lives. Yeah. Like you get an opportunity as an actor to actually play around with embodying all these colors of humanity that for a lot of us, we either never get to or rarely do, certainly. And you're just kind of getting to embody it and play pretend and explore and see what that feels like in your body. And it's a wild experience. Yeah. And maybe in some ways it really does give you more compassion for, like you said, humanity, like what we all, this weird thing we all have to go through, these identities we get lost in. And when you're an actor, you're constantly finding those edges and just like, I wonder what it, what's a map. What is your imagination? What would it feel like to be full of rage? Yeah. What would it feel like to be a fool? You know, whatever it is. Well, those are, those are, those are two that I've definitely uh, encountered and embodied and uh, excelled at uh, rage and <laughs> foolishness. So I was just bad guys and uh, homosexual pretty much was my <laughs> excelling, but uh <laughs> I excelled. Uh, well, so tell me a bit about like, has that been a through line for you for work or where and how did the, the mindfulness and the spirituality uh, become a big part of uh, who you are? You know, I started looking for spiritual solutions to what was ailing me way back in my uh, uh, early 20s, I think. Um, because I was, I was troubled. I was in a really dark, dark, dark place for a long time. And, uh, so I was looking for spiritual solutions, but they were not readily apparent to me at the time. And there was, mm. you know, we, we look at what's available now in terms of, uh, you know, variously called self-help, uh, uh, spiritual, uh, communities, um, wisdom being uh, presented on the internet or in books or, you know, the capacity to, the ease with which you can travel to India and, and talk to people who are, you know, spiritual masters. And that wasn't available. And, and I was looking and looking and looking. So I was trying to meditate for a long time um, and trying to find a connection to source, I guess you would call it. 
Um, and you know, back this was like 40 years ago, I was, uh, I, I took a, a class in science of mind, uh, you know, learning how to do uh, science of mind kind of prayer where you're, uh, where you're, you're not demanding that the universe give you things, but you're, you're uh, manifesting, you're saying this is the way things are. And, mm. um, you know, like that, and just you know, I'm studying the I Ching, and uh, you know, uh, learning various ways of meditation that worked a little bit or not at all, but I still did them. Um, you know, this for I was like the the meditation that I teach today, Vedic meditation. I was I'd been meditating daily for over twenty years before I learned that, um, and it, and. And all of that is not that that meditation didn't do anything for me, but it uh, those other forms of meditation didn't really pay off until I had the experience that I had with Vedic meditation, where I actually was able to have the experience of transcendence, have the experience of experiencing myself life consciousness is something other than my uh head filled with thoughts and my opinions and my ideas of myself or the world or you you know to have that transcendent experience of source of of uh, consciousness itself once i had that then mindfulness uh, the pasana you know sitting and observing your thoughts all those things then then they made more sense because I knew that I wasn't trying to do something with all of that. Rather, I was, those are all practices of not doing anything with mm -hmm. all of that. But I had to have the experience of knowing myself as that place of not doing before any of that made sense. I, I just listened to Dan Harris was talking about, uh, you know, the use of, of plant medicine. Uh, and, you know, he was making the point that until he had the experience with, I don't know if it was psilocybin or ayahuasca or what it was, but until he had that experience of pure freedom, he didn't know what meditation was about. Once he had that, then he knew what meditation was about. And I had kind of the same experience with transcendence, uh, which I learned 20 years ago. Uh, like 20 and a half years ago, something like that. What is it about Vedic meditation, though, do you think that is different or unlock that feeling for you? Because when you, <clears throat> the analogy of like a psychedelic peak experience, it makes a lot of sense to me. Like for, I also felt that a few of those experiences sort of gave me a felt experience and showed me a, a possibility. Then other things made a lot more sense, like books and concepts. I was like, oh, okay. Well, well, the the meditation I was doing before Vedic meditation was uh, they were different ways that I was trying to control the mind, control the way I was using the mind, controlling where I was placing my attention, controlling the what I was doing with my attention, um, and but it was all the mind, all the intellect. Vedic meditation allowed me to have the experience of what I am that is other than the intellect. And it was like, uh, there was a book uh, called, uh, by Franklin Merrill Wolf, and he wrote two books uh, that were seminal for me. One of them was uh, The Philosophy of Consciousness Without an Object. And that's what the transcendent is. It's there's consciousness here, but there are no thoughts, or the thoughts are very subtle and slight. There's consciousness here, but it's not consciousness of I am a body. It's simply the I am. And that I am is, you know, it's variously described as the ground state or the witness self. It's, it's that thing that I know was there when I was six years old looking out at my family and when I was 25 years old hitchhiking around the country and when I was, you know, 40 years old, whatever I was doing then. And when I was 48 years old and I learned this practice of Vedic meditation, it's that, mm. oh, that's, that is actually, it's not just a, a thing that happens here and there where I get to see 
beyond the veils. It's actually the truth of me. And instead of seeing beyond the veils, I am that thing that is beyond the veils. Right. And once I have that experience, even if I have it and then I'm no longer in it, I know it's there and I know it's not somewhere other than where I am. I, I know it's it's in 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 instead it's exactly where I am. And what I realized after years of doing this meditation is that at that moment when I learned Vedic meditation, I stopped being a seeker, but I became even more of a student. Mm. Because I was no longer looking for the truth, because there is no objective truth out there that is greater than the subjective truth of I am. Once I know that subjective truth of I am as something that is felt, that is other than a, a theory, then, then the then it, everything can be looked at through that lens, like, um, like we look at what's going on in the world. How can how can there be a God if all of this is going on in the world? Well, this is the outpicturing of the ego. It's very clear. This, these are people who are, you know, these are the behaviors of the ego. And well, what if I, uh, and, or those thoughts in my head that tell me I'm not worthy of life or of happiness or of love. Well, wait a second. If, if consciousness is the truth of me and consciousness is the truth of life, and there's no separation between me and you, between me and anything. How can these thoughts of, and this aspect of that oneness isn't worthy of life? How can that be possibly be true? It can't. You know, so from that one experience, then all else can be extrapolated from it. All else can blossom from the planting of that seed. And then as you go forward, you become more and more grounded in that underlying truth rather than simply hitting it here and there you start you become grounded in it so that when you're grounded in it then your system can do whatever it does you can go through fear terror anguish sorrow pain joy you're still there and like we said just before we started you know how are you doing i said well it depends on what paradigm you're using to ask that question and from the paradigm of spirit, I, I'm always doing fantastically well. From the paradigm of of uh, emotionality or vulnerability, that you know, there's different days with different feelings, you know. But I'm always really doing well. So I, that was a really long answer that to your great. question. I love it. 